Good day to you. I'd like to introduce you to my wife. Her name is Kelly McKenzie. We're both casual today in our clothes. Good. Yeah. Hello. So Kelly is the department chair of academic enrichment and learning. It's a department at ESU that provides student support services, including tutoring. But I've asked her to join me today because we've spent a lot of time in Britain. How many times have we been to Britain? I don't know. Numerous times. Impossible to count, I guess, especially when our kids were younger. I think I've told you that my parents are British, and so we were going to visit them twice a year, spending all four of us our time sleeping in this one-bedroom space. I had to crawl over my kids in the morning to get up, and a lot of times I was teaching this very course in Britain. I was teaching comparative media twice at Brighton University in the South and twice at Oxford University, and I took ESU students to those courses. So I wanted to ask Kelly, because she's been with me many times to visit my parents in Britain when they'd moved back there with our kids and also participated in some of my class activities, what she remembers most, or maybe singly, if she wants to talk about one incident, about British media. What, what do you remember about British media, which is the subject of our talk today and the subject of the chapter? Well, I guess I'll, I can tell you two things that I recall about British media. One is the use of language. I thought that um, they had a more sophisticated use of, of language. They use bigger words, I guess, than most uh, American media use. So it seemed like maybe a higher education level that they were targeting than EU. US media, and also the humor. Um, they used humor frequently for serious things that we would consider serious subjects. So I remember the first time that I saw a commercial um, that was advertising condoms, and they were making fun of it, and I thought you would never see this in America. Um, a guy was at the counter getting groceries and also getting his supply of condoms, and they made a joke about it. So that was very different, um, and that was the first time I'd seen anything like that. In a, and this was, mind you, like when I was about 24 years old. So coming from the U.S. where that kind of subject matter is not really talked about in that kind of way was surprising to me. Yeah, so thanks for that, Kelly. And just before you leave, can you just mention in a couple moments what services that you provide at the Department of Academic Enrichment and Learning where you might be able to use, I don't mean use in a bad way, but use the services of students. You can help them, but you can also hire them, right? Including, by the way, graduate students. Yeah, so the Department of Academic Enrichment and Learning has several programs uh, that help to support students through their degree programs. So we have tutoring. So we know that students nationally, just not at ESU, but nationally have a challenging time with some of the science courses. Um, and some of you may have a statistics course for your, the grad students um, and some undergrads too. So we do have tutoring for statistics. We also have tutoring for, we don't have tutoring for writing in de the department, but we do have writing tutoring for writing at ESU. We also in our department have uh, assistance for students who fall below 2.0. Sometimes it's a challenge for them to get back on track, so we want to help them to make sure that they do get back on track and that they do complete their degree program because all of us have setbacks. So we just want to help them through those setbacks. And then we also work with first generation students, um, also students of color who with additional advising so that we help them uh, to through their degree programs. I'm a first generation student. My parents never went to college. So I know what it's like for first gen students. Sometimes it can be a very confusing system to navigate uh, if you don't have a parent who's already been through it. All right, so thank you very much, Kelly, for joining class today. And if you have any questions, you can find her on ESU's Department of Academic Enrichment and Learning page. If you want to be a tutor, it's a great job. It really opens up a lot of doors for you. All right, so let's talk about Britain. I'm moving upstairs here today. And, you know, there's a lot of amazing things that I think that this particular chapter failed to get across that I want to mention. So it's a small island, right? It's just bigger than Oregon, which is pretty amazing when you consider some of the accomplishments of the UK across the world. I'm talking namely that the UK, and this is not necessarily, well, it's definitely not, it's definitely not a, an all shining example that I'm about to tell you, the UK controlled 25% of the world at one point. That tiny island had a navy that conquered 25% of the world. And the colonialization that took place of places as far as South Africa, um, uh, uh, Singapore in the, in the Asian print, uh, theater, the United States, Canada, 
um, Jamaica, all kinds of places. And now, of course, the, the means by which these countries were, were um, enslaved in some cases or put into financial captivity, that, that's not the part that I'm seeking to get across. I'm seeking to get across that this tiny country was able to do that. And in so doing, spread its language around the world. The English language is our language our language of choice in the United States. And so it's truly amazing that a country, to me anyhow, that a country that small could have spread its uh, culture and its language across so much of the world. And that is actually the, the reason that we have the birth of such strength in British media, particularly the BBC, as I will be talking about later in the video lecture. The BBC was, was originally founded to keep expatriates, people who had moved away from England, to keep them in touch with the British Empire, with the royal family, with what was happening in Britain. And later on, that particular um, service, the BBC Sir World Service, uh, just was rolled into an overall media plan in developing what is an extremely healthy media industry. So the UK, in case you don't know, is four countries. It's got Northern Ireland. Southern Ireland is a separate country. They'll just call themselves Ireland. We've got Wales, we've got Scotland, and we've got the UK. And I've, I've been to all of them and, and several times. The UK used to be in the European Union following yesterday's class, but Brexit pulled the UK out. The UK, again, to highlight its might, even though it's such a small country, just about the size of Oregon in the United States, it has the fifth biggest GDP, gross domestic product, in the entire world. And there's about 200 countries in the world, so that's an amazing feat. You know, I agree with Kelly's comments about British media, and particularly the humor. The humor is very incisive, if you know that word, and it's also insightful. It's often subtle, and sometimes it can be very direct, taking on subjects that you would not think could be laughed at, such as condoms that Kelly was talking about. In my email today, I'm going to choose a sample of British media content and throw it your way and see if you can figure it out. It takes a lot of paying attention to the comedy in Britain. It's not like easy humor to get. It's not, it's not sarcastic humor, for example, or it's not slapstick humor. Those are easy kinds of humor. With, with British humor, there's usually some wit that you have to, that engages the intellect. And we can see that on British programming. So let's talk about TV. Let's talk about TV. TV is extremely sophisticated in Britain. I can remember watching TV thinking, wow, I wish our TV was like that in the United States. It, the writing, um, the acting, the intensity of the plots. Not that there isn't good TV in the United States. I love Shameless, for example. There's lots of great television in the United States. But overall, when you watch American television, at least from my point of view, having traveled around it, there's a certain uh, monotony to it. And there's a certain dumbing down of it because it's so commercially influenced and is always striving for the largest audience possible. In Britain... You don't have to do that depending on what your distribution channel is, and, and let's talk about that now. So there are really five major TV channels, and they are all national, meaning you can watch them in whatever part of Britain that you want to. Television in the United States is, for the most part, regional and local, except during prime time when you have network programs. But otherwise, when you watch TV, it's local programming. In Britain, you've got these five channels that you can watch no matter where you are. So two of the channels are public broadcasters. That right away is noteworthy. That means that they are um, two out of five, right? So if you only go across these five, you're going to be much more likely to come across these two, which are BBC channels, the British Broadcasting Corporation. It's the most prestigious a public broadcaster in the entire world, actually. The BBC World Service, which is the radio branch, which we broadcast at WESS Radio at East Strasburg University, is broadcast in 145 um, different countries in 45 languages. That, that's how well-developed and robust just that one tiny branch is, just a radio service. So the BBC is a massive company, and it's got these two TV channels. And these two TV channels have a big presence when you go to select your TV program. You're going to be much more likely to capture people. And in fact, the BBC gets the most viewing in the country. It gets 34% of all TV viewing. PBS, I can guarantee, does not get anything close to that in the United States. It's so underfunded. The BBC is a robust entity. One of the most amazing documentaries that I ever saw put out by the BBC was on Alexander the Great. Do you know Alexander the Great? 
Okay, he's he's one of the most his historical figures because he he conquered the entire known world at that time, which was just around the perimeter of the Mediterranean. But he did it on foot. So he actually walked to all of these places. So the BBC did a documentary, and in order to recreate that um, scenario of Alexander, they actually hired an actor and had him walk from the United Kingdom all across Spain, France, Italy, all the way over to Greece, and then on into Egypt, even. And, you know, what would that take to produce something like that? That's expensive, really expensive. And the time that it takes to follow somebody walking, it would be much easier to tell that story by going down and doing the shoot in the course of two weeks, right? We can tell all we need. We can set up some fake scenery, and we can have Alexander out there walking around in his sandals, and we can do it in two weeks. And that's the way that a profit-making production would be, be be created. But because the BBC is founded by is, is funded by license fees, every time you buy a TV set, you pay a license fee. There's a robust income stream, and the people who produce content at the BBC they don't need to worry necessarily about having the biggest audience. Of course, they want to have an audience. They want to make sure that there is an audience. But the purpose is serving the public, letting the public know about historical events like Alexander walking across the earth. And the only way to do it and do it right is to really try and have somebody recreate the steps that Alexander actually took. So we've got the BBC in those two positions, and BBC One, there's BBC One and BBC Two, those are the name of the channels. BBC One is a very general interest programming channel, BBC Two is more specialty. It used to be highbrow, they call it, which would be, it would be running the arts, like opera, and ballet, etc., but now it's just more focused on niche, like it's a leader in comedy, but not comedy for everybody. In addition to those two channels, the next one I want to highlight is ITV. That's the closest you can find to an American broadcaster. It's a commercial broadcaster, and it does have a national presence, but also offers a lot of local programming. If you live in the London metro area, for example, you'll have your own ITV content, versus if you live in the Birmingham area, which is north of London, Birmingham, I should say, in English uh, in the English accent, then that would be, you would have just local Birmingham content. Um, the next channel is an animal that you probably will have a hard time grasping, and, and I still do today. It's a very interesting entity. We just don't find a channel set up this way in the United States. Channel 4. Channel 4 is a publicly owned, not-for-profit, commercial broadcaster. Does that make sense? Commercial coming in at the end? It's publicly owned. It's not privately owned. It's not owned by a board of directors and stockholders. It's not. It's publicly owned. It's owned by the citizens of Britain. And it's not for profit. It's not allowed to make more money than it spends. Yet it's a commercial broadcaster. So you can see advertisements on it. And so what a unique model, right? It's earned just enough money to make it viable. and But to not have profit as the incentive. Moreover, it is chartered, it's the, the term used to express chartered by Ofcom. Ofcom is the Office of Communication in the UK. It's much bigger than the FCC. It has many more powers, including penalties and rolling out laws and controlling who owns what. But Ofcom and the BBC um, chartered Channel 4 to actually push boundaries. That's its mission. It's supposed to push the boundaries of television. I think I'm going to try and find a Channel 4 comedy for you to, uh, to take a look at. It may be tough because of copyright. Well, you can check your email for that. Anyway, that's Channel 4. And then the last one is Channel 5. Channel 5 is like a little regional channel. It's actually the channel that birthed Pop Idol, which became American Idol in the United States. It's owned by a foreign company. It's owned by um, Bert the Bertelsmann Company, a, a German company. All right, so let's now go on to talk about some exports with with TV, just to highlight that British television, you probably know it very well, right? You know a lot of TV shows, but it's the second biggest exporter in the world. The second biggest exporter. You know who the number one is, right? Yeah, that's us, the United States. So we're the third biggest country in the world, and then you have this country the size of Oregon, once again flexing its muscle as a media enterprise. And, and how many of these... British content related people do you know about? You know about Monty Python, right? I just saw on, uh, I guess that's an example of British humor. Um, 
it's an old 70s film, but you probably know about it. Just released on Netflix here in Mexico. I saw it last night, actually. That's why it's on my mind. It's a comedy. Monty Python was a comedy troupe. They did short films. They did comedy skips. They did record albums. And they did this film called The Holy Grail. And uh, I remember when that came out, I was in grade school, I think. And everybody was talking about the killer rabbit the next day. This rabbit, this white rabbit that... They, they were warned about it was ferocious, and they sloughed it off. What can a rabbit do? And this rabbit went berserk, including flying around in the air and biting people. I guess that's British humor. You know, it's zany. It's crazy. It's off the wall, and still it's within context. Uh, certainly, you know, singers like Ed Sheeran, British, right? Uh, maybe older singer Tony Braxton. You know about Tony Braxton? Uh, you know the comic, Sasha Cohen, right? Borat, does all the Borat films. I actually saw him. You want to see some old Sasha Cohen, look up some old Ali G, A-L-I-G. Ali G plays a hip-hop guy who gets all the wording wrong. Uh, check him out and on YouTube. You can find him. You can see some early Sasha Cohen. Of course, we have the royal family constantly covered, and, and just royalty in general. You know, Meghan and Harry, in an endless cycle of U.S. news right now, the U.S. is just absolutely obsessed with the royal family. I can't quite figure it out. I mean, I guess maybe there's a wannabe um, emotion in there. We'd like to have a royal family in the, in the United States. I, I don't know, but royal family has always been in the news. And Princess Di, Diana, Princess Di, recirculating after all these years. Uh, how about shows that you can find on Netflix and other streaming services like Sherlock? Sherlock's a big one. Uh, Downtown Abbey, that's a program that many of you know. And, and many of you know Doctor Who, the sci-fi, which was around in the 70s and then was recycled. So there's a lot that comes out of Britain that you that you already know. Again, this demonstrating its, its muscle in getting programs across the world. Radio is also very robust in Britain. You know, it's you've got a lot of BBC stations. You've got, I think, uh, five BBC radio stations. One's just sports, one's talk. And again, what I want you to consider here is this is the government saying, you know, we don't want to just hand over pop music tastes or popular culture tastes to commercial entities because they, they want to make money. They don't have the, the uh, consumer's best interests in mind necessarily. They just want to make money. I got a phone call from Adobe Edition, a representative last week. Hi, we understand that this has been a very tough year for students. We're just calling to make sure that all of their needs are met and see if there's anything we can do to help your year easier. No, that's not authentic. That's not sincere. You're calling because your market share is probably down and you're looking to increase sales for your product. I mean, just be honest and say that and then I would be much more likely to talk to you about it. And, you know, that's what happens when you have a commercial motive. And so radio in particular has a big role in shaping young people's musical tastes and saying we're not just going to leave that up to your top 40 radio stations in each market to tell young people what they should be listening to. They, they're going to be interested by, they're going to have financial and profit mode of making interests, which are not necessarily bad, but to have a balance, you have public service broadcasters. And those people are airing, uh, those people include BBC stations as well as commercial stations. You have plenty of commercial radio stations. And there's a lot of radio listening that goes on in Britain. 90% of people listen to radio every single week. And everywhere I go, I hear music. You go in a pub, there's music playing. You get into a car, somebody's playing music. You go into a store, somebody's playing music. You go over somebody's house, they're playing music. A lot of music listened to. Another robust industry is the film industry in Britain. It's not just the James Bond films that come out of there. Actually, 26% of all films in the, in the United Kingdom, believe it or not, are U.S. films. U.S. films. So Britain has a strong export film industry and a strong internal film industry, but it's just showing once again the prowess. Do you know that word? The prowess of American media across the world to where you can even see a film in a, the smallest... African Village, if it has electricity and it has a film house, it's going to have an American film. So lastly, what I want to talk about is the tabloids, or are the tabloids, are the tabloids. The tabloids, also known as red tops, because of the top of them having a red banner like this one right here. The tabloids are newspapers in Britain. 
Let me turn the camera around, get my voice down close to it. This one is, I don't even know if you're able to read the words in the right order there. Sometimes they get mirrored. This is the Daily Mail, and you can see up top, it's got a lot of red. If you buy the print version, there will be a lot more red as well. The tabloids are a scathing press. They are called tabloids because they are in tablet shapes, just like a phone. And you open them and you have two pages. Versus a broadsheet, a broadsheet comes and you unfold it and then you open it and it's much wider than a tabloid. Tabloids can be read in mobile places, like when you're on a bus. And if you're living in England, you're on a bus and a train and a subway all the time. It's how people get around. And so tabloids fit in perfectly with a mobile lifestyle of people commuting to work and they're not in vehicles. And what the tabloids have become is a way of harpooning celebrities. That is, in fact, one of the major reasons that Meghan and Harry probably left the United Kingdom, because the tabloids were after them all the time, constantly criticizing them. And there's a scathing way that they write. But tabloids also have a way of writing about old aging rock stars in the UK in, in a way that legitimizes the lifestyle and doesn't call attention to really how decadent a lifestyle is. This one I'm looking at is on my band, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. Actually, my person in the band is Keith Richards, not Mick Jagger. But he could barely contain his excitement on Friday when he when he enjoyed a boys' night out with his fellow Rolling Stones bandmate Ronnie Wood, as well as Spandau Ballet, that's a band from the 80s, Gary Kemp, Sir Mick, Mick is knighted, all part of the royal culture in the UK. Sir Mick put on an animated display as he left Mayfair's popular Harry's Bar ahead of the weekend, flashing photographers with his tongue as he hopped out of the venue looking typically stylish in pinstripe trousers and a black and white shirt that featured a TV static print. The doting father was followed by rocker Ronnie, 73, and Gary, 61. Ronnie cut a casual figure for his night on the town, layering a white t-shirt beneath a gray zip-up jumper and black coat. Now, I know I have a couple students in this class interested in fashion. You can judge for yourself whether this is the kind of writing that is helping you to see how you can describe fashion. But this is typical of the British tabloids, and it's very necessary that I mention them because they are a force in Britain. If you're going to be a political person, if you're going to be a celebrity in England, you have to put up with a whole bunch of scathing coverage from the tabloids. So Britain, small country with a big spread across the world and an equally big spread of media across the world. It's the United Kingdom. Have a great day.